Laudator Jesus Christus, praise be Jesus Christ. This is Matt Gaspers, Managing Editor of Catholic Family News, and I'm joined as always by my friend and colleague, Dr. Brian McCall, who is the Editor-in-Chief of CFN. Hello, Brian. I wish you a blessed feast of Our Lady of the Rosary. I hope you're having a good, good day. Yes, a wonderful day. Great 450th anniversary of the uh, uh, reason for that feast, the Battle of Lepanto. And uh, to commemorate that, it's our first live stream. So we're trying out for the first time live streaming the news roundup. It'll obviously be available to watch in recorded form, but uh, we're, we're going to try around this time, at least for now, to have a live stream. So welcome everybody there. See one comment. Hello, Mr. Adrian, Adrian Yanez. Welcome to you. Uh, we're glad to see people here. And I've got a great show for you. All so, right. as always, Matt, we'll start us off with a little bit about the Saints of this week. Yes, first I'll give us a brief, uh, brief uh, introduction to our stories. So our stories this week are going to include uh, updates on two initiatives originally launched by Pope Francis in 2019, both of which relate to his rather naturalistic vision of human fraternity, one in involving the, the sphere of economics and the other in the educational sphere. And viewers will probably be familiar with them, listeners as well. Uh, secondly, we're going to look at a new and massive report detailing decades of clerical sexual abuse in the nation of France, uh, which covers the years 1950 to 2020. And I believe, the, if I remember correctly, the report is some 2,500 pages long, so very comprehensive. It's been in the works for a couple of years. Um, we're also going to do some continuing coverage of the apostolic visitation of traditional Carmelite convents, specifically here in the United States. And we have some updates, uh, some kind of crucial updates to share with you in that regard. And we will close on a, a positive note. A, a Swiss bishop who has decided to spend his retirement years with the SSPX, we've mentioned him in previous broadcasts, uh, he has granted a new interview. So we'll be going over some of the, the highlights from that interview. Uh, before all that, as Brian said, and, and as we always do, we'll take a brief look at the church's liturgical calendar and spend a few moments pondering the things that are above, as St. Paul says. So today, as we've mentioned, is uh, Thursday, October 7th, 2021, and it is the Feast of Our Lady of the Rosary. It was originally uh, instituted as the Feast of Our Lady of Victory in honor of the victory of the Holy League or the, the forces of Christendom that had come together under really the leadership of Pope St. Pius V and defeated the invading Muslim Ottoman Turks at the famous naval battle of Lepanto, which took place today, October 7th, in the year of our Lord, 1571. And that victory, uh, many historians believe, was really the beginning of the end of the Ottoman Empire. Over the next few centuries, it declined steadily and eventually was dissolved. I believe, during the, the First World War, if I can remember correctly, or shortly thereafter. Well, but, uh, as a result of the, the First World War. Yes. And did you want to add anything further about that battle, Brian? Yeah, no, it's it's really, again, today marks this 450th uh, anniversary, which is, is uh, really worth commemorating. And it was an extraordinary battle because... Uh, it was called for the uh, to save Europe by uh, the Pope, who was Pope St. Pius V at the, at the time. And uh, he uh, called upon Christian forces to come together to battle uh, this threat, which was really an existential threat to uh, um, Europe as a whole. And remember, yes. Europe was already weakened because it had been divided by the Protestant Reformation, which was in full swing at this point uh, in, in Europe. But the Pope actually was able to reach out to uh, even pro some Protestant nations were able to send some um, uh, representatives to the Holy League, to this um, force to fight uh, against them. Even England sent some and really was an extraordinary uh, event. 
they were outnumbered. The uh, Christian forces were really severely outnumbered. But Pope St. Pius V had called upon Christians to pray the rosary uh, for this, this battle. And that's why originally, as Matt said, the feast was called Our Lady of the Victories because it was to mark the celebration of uh, victory. But uh, then later, the, the title changed to Our Lady of uh, the Rosary because it was the rosary that did it. And the reports of the battle say that the soldiers had rosaries tied around their arm on the ships as they encountered uh, the Turks, the Muslims in uh, the yes. day of Lepanto. And here's a brief picture I found uh, representing sort of the, the battle um, at Lepanto, sort of pulling together the Holy League and, and the Alliance. Yes. So it is a, a great solemnity of Our Lady, which permission is given to transfer the feast to the Sunday. So you may have, or you may this coming Sunday, see it at your traditional Mass, because it is such a great feast. Even though it's a feast yes. of Our Lady, you're permitted to transfer it uh, to the Sunday. Yes, and as uh, those watching us on YouTube can see in my background is a banner of Our Lady of Guadalupe, and had, there's actually an interesting connection between Guadalupe and the Battle of Lepanto, which our, our friend and contributing yes. author Kennedy Hall details in an article in our October uh, 2021 print edition. Well, it's also available in e-format if you're a subscriber. So essentially the uh, the lead ship of the Holy League was led by Don Juan of Austria, and he actually had a copy of the original image of the Tilma of Our Lady uh, flown on his, you know, the flagship uh, leading into battle. So Our Lady was literally leading the charge against the invading infidels and and obtained the victory for the Christian forces. So Our Lady of Guadalupe and Our Lady of Victory, pray for us. Yes, as many people have said, and at Ad Valantas, as you pointed out, Padre Pio said the wet rosary is our weapon. This is really yes. the last resource that's been given to us in these times. So. Yes. But there were some other saints. St. Bruno, a great feast uh, this week also, the founder of the Carthusians. Yes. Uh, Carthusian was also this week. Been a big week. We had the yes. Guardian Angels on October yes. 2nd, St. Therese of the Zoo, the yes. great Carmelite uh, doctor of the church on October 3rd. She'll come into play very much in a, a one of our stories today. Yes. And also St. Francis of Assisi, also yes. very relevant to some of our stories. Uh, he's Again, but as John uh, Venari, God rest his soul, used to say, the, the post-conciliar uh, hierarchy often uh, co-ops him and really misrepresents him as basically being a medieval hippie. And uh, sadly, Pope Francis is probably the, the one most guilty of that. So we'll yes. see how that applies in one of our yes. stories. And just a brief reminder before we jump into our first story, uh, this coming Sunday is the official opening of the Synod on Synodality. It's happening, folks. Uh, the, the opening Mass will be offered in Rome on Sunday, October 10th. And so bu buckle your seatbelts. We'll have lots to, to cover uh, over the coming months and sadly years that this thing is going to be going on. Uh, it's not scheduled to conclude until the end of October 2023, if you can believe it. <laughs> so uh, yeah. we will need uh, the virtues of fortitude and, and patience <laughs> to get yes. through it. Yes. All right. So our first story today, as I mentioned, involves two kind of bizarre initiatives launched by Pope Francis originally in 2019. I'll be covering the first one, and Brian will take the lead on the second. The first, as viewers may have heard of, is called the something called the Economy of Francesco. And Pope Francis um, earlier this week, let's see if I let me pull up the uh, address here. So it was actually over the weekend, I guess, Saturday, October mm -hmm. 2nd. He addressed the second global event of the Economy of Francesco. And I'll get into what that is exactly, but I just wanted to read a couple of quotes from his address this past Saturday. So he said, quote, the COVID-19 pandemic has not only revealed to us the profound inequalities that affect our societies, it has amplified, it has amplified them. Since the appearance of a virus from the animal world, pause there, we actually have very definitive proof now that this is, it was not a naturally arriving, arising virus that it was developed in the lab in Wuhan in China and basically released on the world uh, in 
as early as October, actually, of 2019. Uh, as viewers may recall and listeners may recall, I attended the Catholic Identity Conference last this past weekend, and one of the speakers, Stephen Mosier, who is an expert on China, is actually working on a, a politically incorrect guide to pandemics, including COVID-19. And he brought up uh, the the evidence that this this uh, gain of function, you know, a biological weapon basically was released at the military games in Wuhan in October of 2019, very shortly after the whole Pachamama incident, which took place on the the feast of St. Francis of Assisi, October 4th, 2019. So an interesting connection there. Um, but anyway, you know, picking up this quote from the Pope again, he says, since the appearance of a virus from the animal world, our communities have suffered a great increase in unemployment, poverty, inequality, hunger, and exclusion from necessary health care. Well, again, pause. I think a lot, most of those things have been caused not by the virus itself, but by the reaction to the virus, these draconian lockdowns and such. Um, but notice how he's, you know, playing on it. That's just a naturally arising virus that's led to all of this. And the cause is really, you know, our irresponsible way of living. I think that's the implication. So he goes on to say, this is even more astounding. Let us not forget that a few have taken advantage of the pandemic to enrich themselves and close themselves off. Well, if anyone really is guilty of doing that, it's certainly the pharmaceutical companies, as I think yes. Brian would agree, who have produced, uh, you know, what Archbishop Vigano calls the experimental gene serum. <clears throat> So I'm not sure who Pope Francis has in mind, but those are the people who come to my mind immediately. He also focuses uh, a couple of times on the referring to our Mother Earth, which is what the word Pachamama actually means. It means Mother Earth. So he says in this address from Saturday, today our Mother Earth is lamenting and warning us that we are approaching dangerous thresholds. So again, as he's done before, he's personifying the earth as if it's a living person rather than just part of God's creation. That's impersonal. <clears throat> so he's he's writing to these young, you know, young entrepreneurs and, and economists. He says, you are perhaps the last generation that can save us. I am not exaggerating. In light of this emergency, your creativity and resilience imply a great responsibility. I hope you can use those gifts to correct the mistakes of the past and lead us towards a new economy that is more inclusive, sustainable, and supportive. We must work together, he says, and dream on a large scale. With our eyes focused on Jesus, we will find the inspiration to design, wait for it, a new world. He didn't say, didn't include order, but he probably might as well have a new world and the courage to journey together towards a better future. So what exactly is this economy of Francesco? Originally, it was an event announced by Pope Francis in May of 2019. He wrote a letter to, quote, to young economists and entrepreneurs saying, quote, I am writing to invite you to take part in an initiative very close to my heart and an event that will allow me to encounter young men and women studying economics and interested in a different kind of economy, one that brings life, not death, one that is inclusive and not exclusive. That brings to mind the whole, uh, uh, what was it, the inclusive capitalism, I forget the full name. Council for Inclusive Capitalism. There you go, yes. One that is humane and not dehumanizing. Uh, he goes on to say, an event that will help us bring help bring us together and allow us to meet one another and eventually enter into a covenant, in quotes, to change today's economy and to give a soul to the economy tomorrow. And then this connection to St. Francis of Assisi, he explains, surely there is a need to reanimate the economy. Again, this is his letter from uh, May of 2019 and uh, launching this initiative. He says, and where better to do so than Assisi, which has for centuries eloquently symbolized a humanism of fraternity. 
So again, there's that co-opting of St. Francis as being like the, the prototypical hippie of the Middle Ages, a humanism of fraternity, where in reality, St. Francis's mission as God, our Lord, gave it to him was to rebuild the church, which was falling into ruins because of decadence, because of heresy, and all kinds of spiritual problems. So Pope Francis goes on, John Paul II chose Assisi as the icon of a culture of peace. And that's probably the most egregious um, he's referring to, of course, the 1986 Assisi event uh, where syncretism, religious indifferentism were put on display for the whole world, uh, where you see the Pope lined up, you know, on a stage with pagans, Muslims, Jewish leaders, etc., you know, all praying to God, quote unquote, in their own way. Uh, just a terrible, terrible event. So for Fr and Francis says, for me, it is also a fitting place to inspire a new economy. I'm not sure what that new economy is supposed to look like. Um, so the event, this event was supposed to take place in person in Assisi in late March of 2020, but it had to be postponed due to COVID-19 and it ended up being held virtually in November of 2020. So I just have a couple more quotes to read to you from, uh, this is from, Pope Francis's video message to participants in the original Economy of Francesco event held in November of 2020. He says, he quotes the, the line that I just mentioned, our Lord speaking to St. Francis, Francis, go and repair my house, which you can see is in ruins. These were the words, says Fran Pope Francis, that so stirred the young Francis and have become a special summons addressed to each one of us. When you feel called to share actively in the building of a new normal, you know, that's another buzzword in our COVID era, the new normal, because we can't go back to the way things were, apparently, according to some people. Francis says, you, these young economists and entrepreneurs, respond by saying yes. And this is a source of great hope, because he goes on to say, things cannot go on the way they are and further he says dear young economists entrepreneurs workers and business leaders the time has come to take up the challenge of promoting and encouraging models of development progress and sustainability in which people especially the excluded and then he has in parentheses including our sister earth so again personifying the earth uh, will no longer be, at most, a merely nominal, technical, or functional presence. Instead, they will become protagonists in their own lives and in, their entire, in the entire fabric of society. I'm not sure how the planet Earth is going to become a protagonist in the economy, but... Well, and which is she? Is she our sister or mother? I mean, it's a little weird here. Right, right? exactly. But, but essentially, this is him putting into practice intellectually the realm of principles, the Pacamama, right? The Pacamama was enshrined in the Vatican on the papal altar. It's a great offense against the first commandment. But now it's taking that essential pantheism and, and bringing it into everyday life. Right. Now, are we saying that everything's great with the economy? Obviously not. Our economy is a, a basically a socialist economy because the socialists realized they couldn't conquer us militarily. They couldn't conquer freedom militarily. So they essentially have co-opted big transnational globalist corporations who on the Chinese model are willing to work with the socialists, the Marxists, uh, to, for their own par personal profit, but to essentially cooperate and form a centrally planned economy, which is what socialism is, but sort of through the willing cooperation of these big uh, socialist, uh, essentially, companies. And this was the goal of China. When China changed its policy in the 1980s, it, they basically said, okay, the Soviet model's not working. This is the 40-year plan that they've been on uh, to do this. And so the problem is he sees that there's a problem in the world, but instead of pointing out what it is, Marxism, that needs to be undone to go back to local, regional, national freedoms of economic freedom uh, that the church has always supported, he wants more of the same. He's sort of promoting that which has gotten us into this globalist mess. And that, as always, is the problem with the... Uh, with what Francis is suggesting in this realm. Yes, so on a 
on a final note before we move into the second prong of this um, naturalistic human fraternity, which touches in the educational sphere, which Brian is our certainly our resident as expert there. He's a tenured professor in, in the university setting. But the so at the end of this November 2020 event, which was held virtually because of COVID, the participants, the, I assume the leadership, uh, whoever they are, issued what they called a final statement and common commitment, which is essentially boils down to 12 requests. And now I just want to read the, uh, the opening of this. So they said, um, we young economists, entrepreneurs, and change makers of the world summoned to Assisi by Pope Francis in the year of the, of the COVID-19 pandemic want to send a message to economists, entrepreneurs, political decision makers, workers, and citizens of the world. Citizens of the world, interesting phrase. <clears throat> and this is essentially what they're asking for. You know, they have to do, I'll just read a couple of them. Number one on the list, we ask that the great world powers and the great uh, economic and financial institutions slow down their race to let the earth breathe. So again, personifying the earth. Uh, COVID has made us all slow down without having chosen to do so. When COVID is over, we must choose to slow down the unbridled race that is suffocating the earth and the weakest people who live on earth. The one that really caught my attention in this list of 12, however, was the last one, which reads as follows. Finally, we ask for everyone's commitment so that the time prophesied by Isaiah may draw near. They shall, and then it quotes from Isaiah chapter 2, verse 4, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they l learn war anymore, end quote. Now, remember, you know, Father Gruner, God rest his soul, who led the Fatima Center for so many years, he used to refer to this verse as coming, it will come to pass during the, the triumph of Our Lady's Immaculate Heart and the period of yes. peace, the supernatural peace promised to the world if the consecration of Russia is actually done, when it is done. But this statement puts it in very naturalistic terms that it's somehow something we can bring about rather than God and his power through Our Lady. They say, we young people can no longer tolerate resources being taken away from schools, healthcare, our present and our future to build weapons and fuel the wars needed to sell them. We would like to tell our children, it concludes, that the world at war is finished forever. Well, I have news for these young economists and entrepreneurs. According to our Lord's own words, war will not be, quote, finished forever until he comes again in glory. He specifically says towards the end of time uh, before his coming that there will be wars and rumors of wars. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be a great final battle even. Uh, so this is really a utopian fantasy that they're that they're describing absolutely and as archbishop vegan has pointed out a a pretext to assert totalitarian power that's all it is well another uh, initiative that is in parallel with this uh, is this global compact on education and uh, once again this is another brainchild of pope francis uh, that he launched and it got interrupted by COVID. He had a, wanted a big grand event, uh, but he had to concede that he, uh, uh, the lockdowns that he so embraced made it not possible, so it was delayed. But then they eventually had uh, a compact on global education uh, to talk about a new humanism. Well, as if the old humanism weren't bad enough. The humanism right. that gave us Vatican II you know, is problematic because it is rooted in the human rather than the divine. It totally looks to man as an end in and of himself rather than man as a creature of God. Uh, but he wants this new humanism, the way religions can cooperate in education. So last year they had this delayed big hootenanny uh, about, you know, developing new globalist education, new stand global standards of education. Well, on October the 5th, which was uh, earlier this week, um, Pope Francis gave another address to representatives of religions. D 
During a meeting that took place on, on that day in the Clementine Hall in the Vatican Apostolic Palace, on the theme, Religions and Education Towards a Global Contact, Compact on Education. So they had this big meeting, but then they had this other meeting of uh, religions uh, in the Vatican, and he sort of started beating the drum on this other uh, initiative, this other humanist initiative. So I'm just going to read a couple quotes to give you a flavor for this, this problematic address. He said, we are concerned to ensure an integral formation that can be summed up in knowledge of ourselves, our brothers and sisters, creation, and the transcendent. So notice, not God, not our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? All knowledge begins with God, right? and we need to, to know God, who he really is, not some vague, abstract, transcendent like you know, Walt, Walt, uh, Walt, ugh, Ralph Waldo Emerson sitting on his pond, you know, right. contemplating some drug trip transcendence. So Jesus Christ is missing while we're looking at our own navels, looking at ourselves. Going on, we cannot fail to speak to young people about the truths that give meaning to life. Well, you fail to speak to them about those truths, you, you obscure them. If in the past our differences set us at odds, nowadays we see in them the richness of different ways of coming to God and of educating young people for peaceful coexistence in mutual respect. So this is pure and simple Irenism, syncretism. He's outright saying this is reinforcing what he said in the Abu Dhabi document yes. that we've already reported on. Right? In the past, we saw our differences you know, set us at odds. Now he says, oh, the richness of our differences are, are fine. They're good. They're just different ways that we get brought to God. That's what the Abu Dhabi document is saying when it says God will the diversity of religions. That there's one God, but they're all religions are like different pathways to the same God. Well, this is error. This is heresy. Yes. Religions are not different ways to the same God. There is one way to God, the true religion. The other religions are ways away from God. Now, again, as the church has always said, it is possible, although unlikely, for someone in one of these false religions who is invincibly ignorant to find a way to God's mercy to be saved. But they are saved in spite of their false religion, yes. not because of, not on the path, because basically they pushed against their false religion and its logical conclusions, and they reached out to God, not, not knowing everything about him, that they might in theory, although as Pius IX said, we can't even hope for it, be saved. So the, the Catholic Church has proclaimed extra ecclesium nulla salis. There are not many roads to different religions. Pope Francis building on Vatican II, Lumen Gentium, saying that there are different elements of sanctification in all these different religions uh, is just taking this to its logical conclusion. As Archbishop Vigano has said, if we had the Abu Dhabi statement, we first had it at Vatican II. Right. In Nostra Aetate and in Digitatis Humanae are the seeds where he is now. Again, he, Francis told uh, our, uh, Bishop Schneider, oh, yeah, yeah, I didn't really mean it the way people took it. Uh, you know, that's not really what it means. And Bishop Schneider, so you're going to correct it. No, well, not only is he not correcting, he's doubling down on it now. And this is essentially a recapitulation of that, that statement. Shocking. Well, then he gets on a little bit to education. He says, education commits us to love our Mother Earth. Here we go again. In other words, love the Pacamama. Yes. To avoid the waste of food and resources and to share more generously the goods that God has given us for the life of everyone. I think of what one thinker, not a Catholic, used to say, <laughs> God always forgives. We occasionally forgive. Nature never forgives. So again, he, this pantheism that we saw on display in St. Peter's, the papal altar, is part of this globalist philosophy. They want a pantheistic, new agey religion to satisfy that innate natural need for religion in man as part of their totalitarian economy of Francisco. So these are hand in glove, right? This sort of pantheistic world religion is hand in glove with the new world order, and they want to bring it to education to ruin even further. Education's already destroyed by the Marxists, but he wants to destroy it even more. So one final note, uh, I actually went to a little uh, get-together to meet a new congressional candidate who's running for a uh, congressional district in Florida on Tuesday. Uh, Anthony Sabatini, his name is, he's currently a state rep, he's running for, for Congress, said some really, really good things. 
First thing he said is, okay, education. First thing we need to do is just dismantle all the public universities. We need to defund them all. They're lost. They've been taken over by Marxists. Why are we paying for them? Defund them and found some real universities that actually teach the truth. He's not far off. <laughs> I mean, uh, education has been ruined by humanism, and Francis wants to bring more of the same uh, to, a, to, to a school near you. Before we move on, I just wanted to briefly mention, you know, I wish that Francis would uh, read or reread Pope Pius XI's encyclical on the subject of education, Divini Ilius Magistri. We yes. had a wonderful series in CFN, what was it, last year or the year before, by uh, Father, what was it, Father David Sherry yes. uh, of the Society of St. Pius X. And in that encyclical, Pius XI makes it very clear what the true purpose of education is. He says it is to produce men and women, quote, who think, judge, and act constantly and consistently in accordance with right reason, illuminated by the supernatural light of the example and teaching of Christ. So I don't see anything like that, like Pius XI's traditional definition of education in any of this global compact on education. So that, that is an immediate red flag. Absolutely. So we'll move on to our next story. And hello, uh, Brigitte Dunn. Glad to see that you're enjoying the show. Thanks for tuning in and thanks for letting us know that you uh, are enjoying the show. So our next story is this report that was released in France this week. This has uh, been building for quite some time. The French bishops commissioned an independent uh, group uh, to uh, investigate the uh, abuse, sexual abuse of minors by Catholic clergy. So the headline they came out with in the report is it's uh, over 70 year period that they looked at, 1950 to 2020, 216,000 minors uh, were uh, abused, uh, sexually abused uh, by priests. They then say the number of abused jumps to 330,000 when you include victims of people who are not clergy but were working in church schools or parishes. So um, that's that's a sounds like a very, very you know large, obviously, number, even though over uh, 70 years. They say between 2,900 and 3,200 abusers are estimated to have worked uh, in the French Catholic Church between 1950 and 220. So looking at this report, and as Matt said, it's 2,000 pages long, a lot there, this definitely seems to have been a hit piece. And again, I'm not denying there were probably, there were instances of, of sin and abuse. But this seems to be a, just a, a direct hit piece to discredit the clergy. Um, because number one, they throw out a bunch of numbers, but then as you look into the report, they actually don't have proof for these numbers. So you hear this big number, 216,000 or 330,000, but then the report goes on to say they actually only have evidence, right? Go, go, they got all access, they opened up all the um, books uh, of the, the, the different dioceses all over France. Uh, and they gave them access to it, um, and they looked at those, but they actually only found evidence of about a few thousand, looking at 2,700 victims, mm -hmm. not 216,000, 2,700. Um, but they think that they found a th another 4,800 um, um, looking through some other archives and press clippings. Mm -hmm. Now, the archives are fine, but press clippings. So they find a press clipping, somebody's accused of something, they immediately in include it. So again, this is a little deception. They come out with 216,000, then it turns out to be about 6,500. 6, so where did the 216,000 come from? They say, oh, well, that's actually not based on any evidence or documents or uh, even press clippings. They said some other group, not us, conducted a survey of 28,000 people about were you abused, and then we, they just extrapolated from the results of that survey to come up with an estimate that we don't actually have any proof or know this, but there must be, just because there must be. And again, if you know anything about statistics and, and extrapolation, you know, you can manipulate data and, and ask questions a certain way. And, and again, they present it, and certainly the liberal media has presented this like proven facts of 216,000 abuse cases when they really only have evidence of a few thousand, 6,000, and then they just estimate the rest of them. So very, really uh, not fair. And to be fair to French priests, even French Novus Ordo priests, um, you know, th this is not a very fair process to, to throw around these numbers when th they actually don't have evidence and create this problem. So that's major one problem with it. 
The second one, if you read through this this report, um, there is not one mention of the root cause, as Archbishop Vigano has told us, of this crisis. This is primarily not a crisis of pedophilia. It's a crisis of sodomy. It's a crisis of homosexuality. Yes. And it, it was studied in the American case with actual cases, not estimates. Uh, over 80 to 85 percent of cases of abuse of minors were male on male. They were sodomic abuse, not male. Again, that's not to say that abuse of a, of a young girl is good. It's certainly bad. But the overwhelming number of the cases are driven by sodomy. Also notice, as with the McCarra case, many of those abuses were men on men and were not of children, they were actually against, you know, male adult seminarians, and they don't even get into that at all. So they want to sweep under the rug, supposedly a report that's going to fix everything, wants to sweep under the rug the elephant or the serpent in the room uh, and makes no mention or any statistics and all their estimates how many of these were homosexual predators, um, that no mention whatsoever. So really it just seems another uh, chance for the liberal media to delight in some survey and again, that's not to deny the crisis. As Archbishop Vigano pointed out, McCarrick, there are these bad actors since this, the teaching on homosexuality has been weakened that have been emboldened to do more, and it's there. But it is also exaggerated to attack the church and to tear the church down. And I think that's definitely what's going on uh, in this report. Yes. So I know, Matt, if you have any any final comments before we go to our next our next story. No, I don't think I have anything to add. We do have a couple of uh, what I call just news briefs, not uh, too terribly long, but something, a couple of things we did want to mention. Brian has the, the yes. first one. Yeah, the, this uh, this was a really a shocking um, story when I saw this one. It was really uh, uh, amazing because we know, and it really because it gets to the integrity of the sacraments, um, we know that only a male can be ordained a priest. And if someone purports to be ordained a priest uh, who is who's not a priest, uh, they are not validly ordained, they do not have the sacred character, and they do not confer uh, any uh, sacraments at all, what, whatsoever. Yes. Uh, and it's completely null and void. Uh, I guess the so, phrase that you could use to sum up this uh, news item is transgender infiltration. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So that's sort of a background to um, uh, what's going on here. And what uh, the story is, is it has been revealed that the bishops are aware in this country that there are transgendered, so people who are biological women, who are not, according to you know, the church, uh, matter, able to uh, become priests, have been sneaking into and going to seminaries. Uh, and in fact... Um, the Bishop of Milwaukee, who is Archbishop Jerome Listecki, uh, wrote to the uh, United States Conference of Catholic Bishops right. uh, saying that the bishop should consider requiring DNA tests or physical exams of all seminarians to ensure that they're actually men. <laughs> I mean, this is sort of how bad we've come. Now, he explains, quote from his letter, Recently, the Committee on Canonical Affairs and Church Governance was made aware of instances where it had been discovered that a woman living under a transgendered identity uh, had been unknowingly admitted to the seminary or to a house of formation of an institute of consecrated life. Right? Some, uh, so, so someone really dropped the ball there. I mean, that's, a, that's an egregious failure uh, yes. to vet the person. Absolutely. Uh, the individual's sacramental records, he goes on to say, had been fraudulently obtained to reflect the her the woman's new uh, identity. So these people are forging sacramental records, which are not being caught. Uh, and, and, you know, people, and again, not, not saying, you seem a little strange, right? <laughs> nobody. Now, again, he says totally unknowingly, nobody knows. I'm a little skeptical of that claim, that nobody knew about this. I think there probably were some that were looking the other way. Because this is, again, how the liberals and the modernists progress. They give communion in the hand, even though it's illegal, and then get it regularized later. I don't doubt that there are some people who are letting in the door because they want this to happen. But taking him at his word, it was unknowing, but it happened. Right? Um, now, he claims, and again, I don't know how he can know this, in all instances, none of these individuals' medical or psychological reports had signaled past treatments or pertinent surgeries. 
And then he says that none of them received holy orders. Now again, how can he say that? Up until like last week, nobody thought they were even in the seminary. He says, oh, they fooled us because nobody could tell. And we should do biological tests, you know, gen genetic tests in the future to stop it. Well, then how do you know nobody had invalid orders attempt to be conferred on them? Like, how can he even make that statement when he just said we didn't even know when they were in the seminaries until recently? How can he then just say, oh, we don't, has he, has he given a, a DNA test to every functioning priest in the United States? Not. So this is a very frightening story for the, the you know, potential invalidity of a whole bunch of sacraments. Um, again, not baptism necessarily, because that doesn't need an ordained priest, but right. essentially all the others. Uh, so this is really shocking. People it should takes be up in arms about it. to a whole new level. <laughs> to a whole new level. And people should be up in arms. The bishop should be up in arms about this. Yes. And it, and frankly, it I mean, it really calls into question the uh, competence of those who are vetting potential seminarians. If you can't, you know, I think most of the time for a so-called transgendered man or, or transgendered woman, for the average person, I think it's pretty obvious that they are the, <laughs> the opposite, yeah. you know, sex of what they're actually identifying. So, yeah, I, I agree with Brian. There's definitely some suspicion to be had around this whole yes. situation and certainly hope that it, they get it sorted out in, a, in short order. So our other uh, just very brief item before we move on to another uh, more detailed story, as viewers and listeners may have heard, uh, news broke earlier this week, Monday, actually, that Cardinal Peter Turkson, who is the prefect for the Dicastery of Integral Human Development in the Vatican, he's also the Vatican's point man for the infamous World Economic Forum's Davos event, the annual globalist event held in Davos, Switzerland. He has publicly said now that Joe Biden should not be denied Holy Communion. Um, no surprise, it was the National Catholic Reporter, or as we like to say at CFN, the National Catholic Distorter, who reported on this story. And the headline says, Top Vatican Cardinal says Biden should not be denied Holy Communion. Cardinal Turkson says denying the sacrament should only take place in, quote, extreme circumstances. So apparently the most extreme pro-abortion so-called Catholic uh, politician and president in United States history, that's not extreme enough for Cardinal Turkson to deny him Holy right. Communion. This is what he said during an interview with Axios, which apparently... Uh, premiered on HBO on October 3rd, so uh, this past Sunday. He says, quote, the Eucharist should not in any way become a weapon. Well, we agree. It also shouldn't be uh, desecrated by those who are publicly and notoriously in grave sin, as canon law says. Cardinal Turkson goes on, if you say somebody cannot receive communion, you are basically doing a judgment that they are in a state of sin. Well, that's kind of the point, Your Eminence. <laughs> like, that's that's part of the office of the priesthood, right? To teach, yes. to govern, to sanctify. Well, the governing office includes making those sorts of judgments, and yes. it's no secret that Joe Biden is publicly and obstinately uh, in grave sin because of certain positions that he holds. So it's just it's very sad and unbelievable that a, a cardinal, a prince of the church. Uh, would say that Joe Biden should not be denied Holy Communion. Really unbelievable. So we'll move on to uh, a little bit more detailed story, and I have some interesting information to share with you about this whole issue of the apostolic visitations of traditional Carmelites, uh, specifically in the United States. So on October 1st, last week Friday, the first day of the Catholic Identity Conference, Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano issued a, uh, an excellent statement, which he calls in defense of convents of religious sisters of contemplative life. And I'll just read a little bit from the beginning. He says, with profound sorrow and strong indignation, I follow the events related to the apostolic visitations that the Congregation for Institutes of Consecrated Life and Societies of Apostolic Life is carrying out in various convents of contemplative women religious in the United States. He's referring, of course, as we reported last week, to the Carmelite uh, monasteries in Pennsylvania, uh, the one in Fairfield in particular, 
particularly was just just finished up their visitation when we reported last week and also the uh, kind of the mother house of the traditional Carmelite uh, convents in the United States in Valparaiso, Nebraska. I believe they've also had a visitation recently. So Archbishop Vigano goes on, the manner in which these apostolic visitations are conducted in violation of the canonical norms and the most elementary principles of the law, the intimidation and threats that characterize the interrogations to which the nuns are subjected and the psychological violence exercised over the members of these convents against the principles of charity and justice that ought to inspire the action of officials of a papal dicastery. All of these, Vigano says, reveal in all its disturbing evidence the prejudice of the persecutory intentions of the visitators, who are cynical executors of the orders already given by the prefect Cardinal Yao Braz de Aviz mm. and by the secretary Archbishop Jose Rodriguez Carballo, following Bergoglio's <laughs> precise instructions. So this seems to be, I think what he's getting at is it's definitely tied to Traditionis Custodas. It's also tied to the instruction, the what he calls the infamous instruction, Cor Orans, which is a very it, radical uh, change to the way that religious life, uh, an understanding of religious life and the way that it's meant to be carried out. Um, so let's see here. We also have, I just want to, just to drive home the importance of having traditional contemplative souls in the church praying for the church it's providentially uh, throughout this week you know i enjoy the devotional book divine intimacy as, as some viewers may know because i've brought it up before so this is from yesterday's meditation called apostolic prayer and it says in part if god has willed the distribution of grace in the world to depend upon the prayers of men and women obviously and if people today pray so little, now this book was written in 19, originally published in 1953. So think about how much more applicable this is in 2021. If people today pray so little, many indeed, and perhaps most of them not at all, and how much more true is that today than in 1953, it is extremely necessary to have in the church souls who are totally consecrated to prayer by their lives of continual prayer adoration and unceasing praise to the most high these souls supply for the negligence and carelessness of many and thus they re-establish in the world the balance between god's rights and man's duty between action and contemplation and it goes on to say the prayer of contemplatives is the secret and guarantee of victory for those who struggle in the world, even as the prayer of Moses was the secret and guarantee of victory for Israel. It's referring back to the incident in the, the Old Testament when the Israelites were wandering in the desert and there was a scene when they were uh, going into battle against one of the Canaanite tribes, I believe it was, and as the scripture says, as long as Moses kept his hands raised and was praying, the Israelites were winning. But if he faltered, if Moses faltered in his prayer, the Israelites started to lose the battle. So very important for us to understand the importance of having devoted contemplatives in the life of the church. They are truly indispensable. Mm. Um, so LifeSite News this week uh, interviewed a Father Maximilian Mary Dean, who is a Franciscan friar of the Immaculate, uh, you know, was part of the order when it was sadly dismantled back in um, the fall of 2013, one of Francis's first major offensives against tradition after becoming Pope. And our friend Micah Hickson at LifeSite News has written an excellent summary of this interview. We don't have time to go into all the details, but her headline captures something interesting. In addition to the Fairfield nuns being persecuted currently, the, this priest that was interviewed actually revealed during the interview that um, Mother Angelica's own convent in Hansville, Alabama, and some other foundations associated with it 
were visited back in 2010, I believe it was, and they were treated in a similar fashion. Basically, the the this priest said at one point that the visitator, a a woman religious, actually said, you know, all the nuns who had an inclination for the traditional Latin mass were quote sent home because they didn't have a vocation. <laughs> well, those were probably the ones who actually did have a real vocation, but their hate, the hatred for tradition was so strong that their presence was apparently just odious to, to the visitators. Very sad. No, it's very sad. And this revelation is a good reinforcement why these visitations should be taken seriously and do not bode well. Um, because we have the Franciscans Immaculata. We now learn that this happened, and check the year, 2010. This yes. was before Pope Francis. This exactly. was supposedly under the heydays of Pope Benedict that this radical nun was sent there to destroy Mother Angelica. Because again, they weren't traditionalists. They were conservative. They had a hybrid Latin Novus Ordo Mass, most nuns. Right. Uh, but saying anybody was inclined towards it had to be sent home. That is clearly what was going on back in 2010. And that's, you know, clearly what going to be, is going to be on now. And we know that they destroyed uh, what was built there. Again, Mother Angelica, for all of her faults, did was very solid on Catholic doctrine um, and really moved further and further towards tradition. But we know that that place was, was taken down. And was uh, there was a time in 2014. It's yeah, not it was a time. to call out erring members of the hierarchy either. No, they weren't. In 2014, they refused EWTN, that was the apostle that started by Mother Angelica's convent, wouldn't cover a conference where Father Radcliffe, a radical kind of Slim Jim type, you know, Father Jim's Martin type, uh, was speaking. They said, we can't be a part of this conference. Now, this monastery is hosting quotes by Father Radcliffe, who supports regularization, acceptance of homosexuality. So these visitations have consequences. Yes. Uh, that's the real point that uh, Dr. Hickson uh, demonstrates for us. Right. And something else I wanted to share with our viewers, I'm sure they'd be very interested to know. I was a friend of mine a, a, who's close to the Fairfield Monastery forwarded me a message that was sent out to friends of the monastery from the Mother Superior, and it's dated October 3rd, the Feast of St. Therese of Lisieux, and here's a little bit of what she of what she says. This is um, Mother Stella Marie of Jesus, who is the prioress of the Fairfield Carmelite. Uh, she's uh, the Fairfield Carmel, I should say. She says, "Dear our, to our dear families and friends, praised be Jesus Christ." On October 26, 2021, our community received a notice informing us that we would receive an apostolic visitation from September 25th to the 28th. Given that this was totally unexpected, our good bishop, after listening to my concerns, gave me his blessing to go to Rome itself. So I think this is the first time that this has been made public, that, that Mother Stella Marie traveled to Rome to try and intercede on behalf of her community. Uh, therefore, three of us, accompanied by Catherine Bauer, who is a, a laywoman who helps at the monastery, made the pilgrimage to the Eternal City. While in Rome, I also took the opportunity to write a letter to our Holy Father, Pope Francis, expressing our desire to continue to live our constitutions of 1990. And she explains in parentheses, that is the 1581 constitutions written by our Holy Mother, St. Teresa of Avila. We were able at the same time to meet various trustworthy persons to tell our story, to listen to their counsel and gain their support. During this trip, our Lord granted us many graces, assuring us through the designs of his providence that he watches over and protects those whom he has called to belong to him. And then she goes on to say, by the grace of God and the strength, uh, we were able to communicate to our nuns from our trip. Our spiritual family of the Carmel of Fairfield was able to weather a difficult moment in our monastic life. We have been galvanized as a community in a profound unity of purpose and mind. So it sounds like they are very firm in their attachment to tradition and have no intention of capitulating and grounded in a sincere affection and charity for each other. Together, she says, we wish to remain ever faithful to our Carmelite charism, no matter what the cost. Well, God That's bless, wonderful. That's God great. bless Mother Stella Marie of Jesus, and let's continue to pray for them. 
yes, that they will remain uh, faithful to that fortitude. Yes. Well, as Matt said, we're going to end with a very positive story. Uh, it's a story about Bishop Vitas Huander, and you can see him there uh, celebrating a uh, mass, pontifical mass, in the traditional Roman rite. Um, we've mentioned Bishop Huander previously uh, in uh, the fact that when he retired as a bishop in uh, Switzerland, he decided what he was going to do was to retire to a priory of the Society of St. Pius X and live the rest of his life in a house, a traditional house, and essentially only participate in the traditional liturgy and um, traditional mass. And uh, he's been there, and he also told us that before he did this, he went to Pope Francis and told Pope Francis where he was going to go live. Uh, and Pope Francis said, oh, yeah, that's great. Go ahead. <laughs> Just have to laugh. So he's been fairly quiet. He, he sort of made this move. He's retired there, uh, but hasn't spoken too much publicly. Uh, but he did grant an interview on August 26th, which you can see um, uh, online at uh, the... Uh, sspx.org news site. And it's really a beautiful interview, him talking about this decision. So I just want to read one uh, couple of comments uh, from it. Uh, the interviewer says, as a bishop, you have naturally chosen a motto. Your motto, instauraria omnia in Christo, to renew all things or to strengthen them in Christ. That was the same motto as that of Pope Pius X. Why this choice? So back before he became traditional, when he became a bishop, like Bishop Vigano, he was with the conciliar church, he chooses, though, this motto, the answer. It really is a connection with Pope St. Pius X. I was 12 years old in 1954 when Pope St. Pius X was canonized. I can still remember the picture of the Pope that we received during our catechism. This motto was written at the bottom of the picture. That made a deep impression on me and has been with me ever since. I know that in 1960-61, when the question of a council was in the air, because it had just been announced, there were various discussions at high school on the council, the expectations of the council, etc. And I remember that they said that the church must renew herself, etc. I answered them with this motto, and I said, yes, the church must renew, her renew herself, but according to the motto of Pope St. Pius X, renew all things in Christ. Really yes. a beautiful story there, um, and saying that the, the way to renew the church you know, is not through novelty, but through Christ, by returning to tradition. Um, yes. And it's interesting, I see his connection with the Archbishop Vigano, that there was this, clearly a, a pious raising, you know, period where the, both bishops were raised in a Catholic environment, and that allowed them, even though they became complicit with the, the, the conciliar church, um, to have their eyes open, as, as he has done. So he's asked, uh, how is it going? How, I mean, you're now living with in a house of a supposedly not canonically regular right, group of priests. Uh, and when you were just a Dasa's, regular old Dasa's and bishop, how is it going? Do you have any regrets? The bishop says, certainly I'm very happy with this choice. Perhaps it is important to know how all this happened, because there was a whole evolution First of all, very early on as a priest, I had sporadic contact with the faithful tied to the society. But these were not very regular contacts. However, I had already gotten to know the society at that time. Then everything was happening with the movement in favor of tradition, una voce. Finally, as a bishop, I had the advantage of contacts with traditional faithful and also with the priests. I had even received a visit from some of the members of the Society of St. Pius X. That is when I got to know them. Then I discovered the school here in Vangs, uh, where I had uh, ever been invited to crown, even been invited to crown the statue of Our Lady. This was later around 2012, 2013. And then he goes on to, to say how he discovered more, how he found the Mass, how he found the traditional breviary, uh, and how he continued speaking with the Society priests, and then eventually reached this Conclusion, which he explains in the interview, to completely give up the new mass, only say the traditional mass, um, and uh, only uh, the traditional breviary. So it's it's interesting, and it's a good reminder for us that Archbishop Vigano has of how we should approach priests and bishops in the conciliar church. Right? We should 
be firm on doctrine, not compromise at all, not, com com not be complicit with the new mass, but we should reach out to them with contacts. We should have an open hand to them. Right? Notice he has this periodic contact. The priests, the traditional priests didn't say, oh, well, you're a Novus Ordo bishop. I don't even talk to you. Forget it. Right? They met him. They talked to him. They invited him. They invited him to come crown the statue. And these contacts were a moment of grace. They opened his mind and his heart. Now, again, when God gives a grace, one has to be open to it. He chose to be open to it, and that's great. And look at where it's led him now to be a holy traditional uh, bishop, to live the traditional life. Yes. Uh, so then he gets asked, and this is something I've heard, some criticism, because, again, there's always criticism. Um, criticism, oh, why isn't he like Archbishop Vigano? Why isn't he speaking out, writing these letters? Okay, and yet I'm the greatest fan of Archbishop Vigano. I'm glad he speaks out. But it's another reminder to us that, you know, there are different roles, there are different gifts with the same spirit, and his role seems to be sort of quietly living, living the life, um, the traditional life. And he gets asked a question about this, why aren't you making sort of public declarations? Um, he says, yes, absolutely. On the one hand, I attach great importance to living and showing my convictions. But on the other hand, it is important to me uh, that there is a sense in the society that this example is also a support for it. I want to say for the society itself, but also for the priests who are looking for tradition so that they can see that this example strengthens them. Of course, there are other things as well, conversations, for uh, example, uh, through which I can give witness. But above all, it is important that my life itself be a witness. And it's really beautiful to see what he's saying is he, his goal, what he thinks God's calling him to do, is to go move in with the society as a witness, mm -hmm. to speak through his war, his actions. Look, these are good traditional priests. Here's the answer. Right? Here's the answer to the crisis in the church. I'm living it. And to say only the traditional mass, as he now does, right. uh, and to live the traditional life. So again, we have to be fair. There's been criticisms of Archbishop Vigan. Why isn't he going out? Why didn't he join and move in with society? Well, he's seen God's given him, God's will for him is a different path. To speak out, to be a galvanizing voice, which he's doing well. Bishop Wander says, I have a different role. Mine is to show the example for priests where to go, what to do, and how to really solve the, the crisis in the church um, this way. So really, it's a beautiful interview. It's very long. I only had a chance to pick out a few quotations. But it's really beautiful to read and see the life of conversion, the conversion of this great uh, this bishop, whom we should welcome with with open arms. If yeah. I could add one one more quote to the, the ones, the great ones that you've listed. He was asked specifically... Can you also bear witness that young people here, meaning in the society, receive a true spirit of yes. the church? Our society is, in fact, often accused of having a schismatic attitude or intention. Uh, in other words, can you really confirm that this work is what the church has always wanted through all the centuries and still wants it today? And since we're running uh, short on time, I won't read all of his answer, but I'll just say, uh, His Excellency says, as far and as far as the accusation of schism goes, well, I have an anecdote to tell you. You know that I have had many contacts with the Holy Father, meaning Francis, also on the subject of the society. The question of schism was brought up, and the Holy Father himself said on several occasions, listen well, quote, this is not a schismatic community, end quote. So for all those out there who are obsessed with continuing to falsely label the Society of St. Pius X as schismatic, that's what Pope Francis says. If you accept Francis as Pope, he says this is not a schismatic community. Uh, the bishop goes on to say, Pope Francis himself said this to me during a private audience. I just point that, point that out in passing, also in order to reassure people who keep returning to this subject or who suffer from this false accusation. Hmm. Yes, we commend the to you. Also commend the letter on our website that I showed you earlier of Archbishop Vigano in support of traditional religious. They're both very worth your reading. Yes. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for our first inaugural live stream. Uh, really thank you to all of those who tuned in and those who will be watching, obviously, uh, later. It was good to see you here. It's good to see your comments to encourage us as, we, as we're going along. Uh, thank, thanks, John. I commented on uh, renewal in the U.S. will start state by state. Absolutely right. 
Yes. Um, that, that's good. Good point. We have to start what we can do local. Hello, Felix Espina. Wonderful. Hola. Good to see you, Felix. Greetings from. Uh, uh, it's good to see you. So he's. I know he's a longtime viewer, a very a very uh, loyal viewer of Catholic Family News. So Felix Espina, nice to see you. Uh, all of you, thank you for joining us and supporting us. Uh, you can also help after this video is there live, both in Rumble, where we'll upload it here in YouTube, forward it to your friends uh, and relations and, and contacts, and uh, spread the word to get this news out to everyone. And also consider subscribing to Catholic Family News uh, online uh, where or through our uh, office in Buffalo, where you can get a paper delivered every week uh, to your tablet or your door. So we will conclude and I invite all of you who are still in the live stream to pray along with us wherever you are, to pray for our country and for our church. Yes, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the prayer against Marxists that was dear to the heart of John Venari. Eternal Father, I offer thee the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ and all the instruments of his holy passion, that thou may put division in the camp of thy enemies, for as thy beloved Son is said, a kingdom divided against itself shall fall. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. St. Therese the Child Jesus, pray for us. Our Lady of Victories, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Have a wonderful weekend, and we look forward to seeing you live uh, again, hopefully the same time next week. Godspeed.